Corruption, as radiation knows no borders. Corruption is equally invisible. However, it erodes society, killing us on a daily basis. Last year, during the Chernobyl disaster anniversary, our conference had to take place for the first time. It was called Zero Corruption Conference. Kyiv would bring together different guests and they would visit Chernobyl. Because of coronavirus, the plans had to be changed. And this year we meet in this hybrid dual setup. But I think we shall revive the idea someday. A year ago, we started interna an international poster contest. We partnered with this legendary Design, designers association that is called the, for, the fourth block. The topic of the contest was corruption as a safety threat. They covered environment, digitalization, professional across the world responded to our call. We received a total of 1,300 posters painted by 450 designers, artists, showed their visions from Canada, Mexico, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and naturally Ukraine. And today we are willing to present you the best artworks of this international contest. And we have a special guest today. And it will, the contest will be accompanied, but the youngest uh, DJ from Ukraine, when DJ Crystal was as little as 10 years old, she set the record as being the youngest DJ in this country. So let's look at the presentation and listen to modern Ukrainian music.
Це просто неймовірні роботи та ще й такому концептуальному супроді. Я дякую діджей Кристал за нашу майбутнє. Я дякую вам за цю генерацію. Ми вирішуємо корупцію та демократію. І я дякую вам за це. We shall upload all the videos of all the panel discussions. You can re-watch them. You can re-listen to the messages sent by our foreign partners. And now I would like us to see another pre-recorded message from U.S. Senator Ben Cardin. Hi, I'm Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. I serve as chairman of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, and I am the author of the Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act. I am grateful to be with you today at the Zero Corruption Conference. This conference is emblematic of the strength of the Ukrainian civil society, which remains Ukraine's greatest asset in on its ongoing fight with corruption. Russia uses corruption to undermine Ukraine's democratic development. The strategic corruption cannot be fought solely by Ukraine, but also must be confronted by all who stand for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And it's not just Ukraine that is targeted by the strategic corruption of dictators. Russia has applied these same tactics to many other countries, as has China. It's imperative that the United States and our allies fight back. This means building a more resilient financial and legal system at home, targeting kleptocrats abroad, and helping other countries build the rule of law. To fight back against strategic corruption, we in the United States Congress have adopted an agenda that emphasizes transparency, accountability, and responsiveness. Some of our greatest tools for accountability are Magnitsky sanctions. These sanctions on the worst human rights abusers and most corrupt kleptocrats block bad actors from our shores and financial systems, and provide a measure of justice to victims of kleptocracy. Magnitsky sanctions are particularly potent against strategic corruption, since they can disable the oligarchs and cronies who are often the vehicles for it. These sanctions have also seen wide adoption by Canada, the United Kingdom, and the European Union, although the European Union has yet to adopt corruption sanctions. Transparency is also critical and sorely lacking. Too often, kleptocrats are successful in brushing their crimes under the rug. That is why I introduced in the United States the Combating Global Corruption Act 
This bill would mandate that the State Department create a tiered ranking of countries based on their compliance with anti-corruption commitments. This list would name and shame leaders of countries that are not doing enough to fight corruption and authorize sanctions against those leaders in the lowest tier for whom corruption is not an anomaly but a form of governance. Finally, responsiveness is key. Sadly, U.S. rule of law aid has often been stuck in technical multi-year programs not fit to fight the rapid tactics of strategic corruption. The Countering Russia and Other Overseas Kleptocracy Crook Act, which I also introduced in the United States Senate, would change that. The Crook Act creates an anti-corruption action fund financed by a charge on companies guilty of paying bribes to foreign officials that will collect these prevention payments over time in order to surge these resources during historic windows of opportunity for reform, like the 2014 Revolution of Dignity right here in Ukraine. In addition to these bills, I am proud to announce that the United States Helsinki Commission will soon form a bipartisan caucus against foreign corruption and kleptocracy. Congress is leading the way in recognizing corruption as a national security threat and creating the tools needed to fight it. We look forward to working with our allies to curb corruption's corrosive influence. Thank you for having me, and I wish you a productive conference. Once again, our guests reiterate that corruption is the key threat to national security, not just of the United States, but also of Ukraine and other countries. And now we are moving on to three blitz panels, which are united by the same subject, which is searching the response to weaponization of corruption in hybrid warfare. In the first section of this panel, our speakers are going to discuss the recovery of assets um, obtained in an illegal way. Today we already talked about this together, uh, and we are going to discuss it more with NABU Director Artem Sidnik. In the second section, our speakers are going to speak about declaration of assets with Alexander Novikov of the NACP. And in the third part, we are going to talk about the tools of uh, fighting against uh, transport their corruption and uh, please get ready for this marathon. Um, the moderator of the first section will be Greta Fenner, the executive director of Basel Institute of Governance uh, and the director of International Center for Assets Recovery. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, moderating this first uh, Blitz panel in a marathon. We are going to talk about investigating transborder corruption and recovering stolen assets. And I have a wonderful panel with me. To my left, Artem Sitnik, who truly needs absolutely no introductions in Ukraine and more widely in the world. He's, of course, the director of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau in uh, Ukraine. Also with me, but on uh, the screen behind me really, is the one and only Mary Butler, who is a, a career anti-corruption prosecutor, also someone very well known and a good friend to Ukraine here. She heads the Department of Justice's Kleptocracy anti uh, Asset Recovery Initiative. And as I said, has been closely involved in supporting Ukraine for many years. I believe also on the screen behind me, I have Ambassador uh, Roger Dubach, uh, also an old friend of mine, career diplomat in the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, where he is currently the Deputy Director of the Directorate for Public International Law and heads something that's rather unique in Switzerland, namely the Asset Recovery Task Force, which is hosted in the Federal Department for Foreign Affairs. Blitz talk means quick answers. Artem, the first one to you. Um, at last count, I understand there are something like 19 parliamentary initiatives trying to get you out of your job. And in my books, that can mean only one of two things. Either you're doing a terrible job and they really need to get rid of you 
for Nabu to finally flourish, or you're doing a very good job and people are scared of you. Tell me what it is. Well, actually, the assessment of our work, if we speak about legislative requirements uh, and whether we work effectively or not, should be um, answered by the audit, which is uh, carried out every year as prescribed by the law. But uh, for some reason, the government always um, refuses to use this option for oversight of the Bureau. And the Parliament uh, tries to achieve a change of leadership in the Bureau instead. Why does this happen? It happens because uh, even though uh, we have uh, had a long time since the revolution of dignity and the establishment of the anti-corruption infrastructure, political elites are not ready uh, for the fact that there is an anti-corruption system in the country which uh, oversees you regardless of where you work and what position you hold. If we speak briefly about the results that were achieved uh, together by uh, prosecutors, detectives and judges. In the short time that we exist, uh, we have had six ministers and their deputies brought to uh, justice, 11 heads of executive agencies, over 60 judges, and I think this creates a major problem for um, the authorities, and that leads to attempts to block our work. And this um, is not only about the Anti-Corruption Bureau, but the anti-corruption system in general instead. Uh, on uh, Friday, we had the 10th real conviction, uh, and this uh, is a big problem for everyone. So then we get the situation when we are trying to be stopped all the time. Thank you, Artem. So domestically, clearly, um, the situation is already very difficult, but many of the cases that NABU is investigating are international in nature, which doesn't make life much easier, of course. So. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience working with other countries, because the topic of this session is international investigation. Um, are the other countries helping you? Are, are the other countries helping NABU? Are they helping Ukraine? And one of, one of, what, are some of the, uh, what are some of the major challenges that you're facing when you're tracing assets internationally? Well, this is a highly urgent issue because without international cooperation, I believe we cannot speak about effective fight against corruption in the first place. We have worked together for uh, quite a while, for multiple years, and you know that uh, we work uh, internationally to uh, disrupt corruption schemes. You speak about uh, the misappropriation of public funds. Mm. Uh, and laundering fights outside the country. We do have issues here because those uh, uh, people who obtain assets illegally, they Mm, don't trust their country and they want those assets to be stored abroad. So in order to carry out the complete investigation, we often work with our international partners. We calculate that in the six years of our work, we sent uh, uh, requests on assist, international assistance to 75 countries across the globe. So you can imagine the scope of corruption in Ukraine and number of uh, countries which were somehow involved in the flow of corrupt assets. We sent most of our requests to Germany, to the UK, to the United States, to Latvia, and some other countries as well. Thankfully, from the uh, very beginning, the NABU obtained the right of independent transnational cooperation with our partners, because now we see a certain resistance from other law enforcement agencies when it comes to international cooperation. That is why it's very important, essential, that we have the right to approach our international partners independently, and we do use this right. We constantly develop a memorandum on uh, cooperation, and if we speak about examples of such cooperation, uh, recently we had um, the first anti-corruption operation in the history of Ukraine together with our Polish colleagues, when an international investigatory group was established, which uh, investigated the former head of Ukratodor, Currently, this uh, person is being investigated in Poland, and we continue our work. We believe this uh, experience to be successful.
wonderful, just as was our experience with uh, cooperation with our Swiss colleagues concerning investigation of a former MP. And it was a very positive cooperation, as assessed by our detectives. These are just some examples that uh, I believe mm, are definitely not exhaustive, and we constantly develop our cooperation further. Well, thank you, Artem, and congratulations. I mean, what you just described is, is clearly a very proactive stance by NABU, including what you describe as a joint investigation with uh, the Polish colleagues. And one point that I would like to stress, which is globally important, is the ability of a national anti-corruption bureau to act independently when it comes to mutual legal assistance and international cooperation in order not to add a potential layer of undue influence in the work of what an agency needs to be able to do independently. You mentioned the cooperation with, uh, with Switzerland and you mentioned it very positively, so let me turn to, to our colleague, Ambassador Dubach. Roger, um, we know, and it's been in the media, and uh, Artem has referred to it, there are assets that are suspected to have been stolen from Ukraine on the previous regimes and that have been found in Switzerland. Can you tell us a little bit how, you know, the various ways in which Switzerland can assist a country like Ukraine, both in terms of the legal framework, but also maybe some of the good practices that Switzerland has, has developed, which a country like Ukraine can make use of and has possibly done so? Thank you very much for, for the question, uh, Greta, and many thanks also for the invitation today. Uh, I have prepared a very short slide, uh, which I would like to share with you. If possible, you could uh, put it on the screen. I don't. Um, where I try to explain very shortly the Swiss legal framework <laughs> and with the example of, uh, of, of the, the work we, done, we have done with Ukraine. Um, we'll have to see if it works. Otherwise, I can try to share my screen with <coughs> this, if you prefer that. Okay. No, it's not a, not a presentation. Oh, that's the wrong slide. Yes, we are seeing um, Artem Sitnik's slide. Do we have Ambassador Dubach's slide? Otherwise, Roger, you might just have to speak to us about it. Roger, are you still there? <laughs> okay, I'm a bit lost here. <laughs> um, Roger, can you hear us still? Okay. Let's see what's happening because we are looking for both uh, panelists who are supposed to be on the screen as well as the slide and it's just Artem and me. I'm sure we have interesting things we can talk about as well. Uh, I don't know where the conference organizers are. Apologies for this technical glitch that I am, which is a little bit out of my control. Someone seems to be coming. Is it just us? I will speak to Mr. Sitnik now. Well, Artem, let's be ca spontaneous in our conversation. I think uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you more towards the end of the conversation, but let's take it now, is um, if you had this one wish or th what, what more, I mean, you've been speaking very positively about your experience internationally, but what more could international partners do uh, to assist Ukraine? Is there, is there anything that you keep talking about or you keep thinking this would be really helpful, maybe in the global legal framework or practically in terms of collaboration? Yes, of course, uh, having experience of uh, cooperation with our international partners, we often speak uh, not only about uh, sp uh, specific criminal cases, but we also uh, speak about the improvement of the system at some point, because there are some traditional problems which are encountered by all law enforcement agencies, not just in Ukraine, but uh, worldwide, for example, the offshore areas where uh, the money ends up in, ta in those tax 
safe havens. And um, when we speak about uh, countries like Panama, we uh, wait for international orders for a year or more to get that information available. Of course, that negatively affects the criminal proceedings that happen. And I think that um, the system of international cooperation was formed quite long ago, which is the problem. Those people who use corruption schemes have uh, completely different tools. They can use the internet, they use modern technologies, and that's what they use to impl uh, implement those corruption schemes in multiple countries at once. But then we use those old mechanisms and we have to wait for responses for a long time. So I think it's an urgent issue to optimize international cooperation to make it more rapid, more efficient. I can compare, you know, for instance, the cooperation um, uh, in the format of uh, police information exchange. This is much more efficient because it happens rapidly and we have the result pretty much immediately. But if we speak about uh, judicial uh, persecution, we need to maintain a very strict procedure, which uh, takes quite a lot of time. And we face the pressure to recover assets. progress. So I think that um, um, we do have over 120 million dollars, 8 million euros, uh, millions of Swiss francs uh, uh, seized abroad, so we could uh, recover all those assets to Ukraine. Thank you, Artem. And I think I couldn't agree more with you that it's very frustrating how criminals are fast in cooperating internationally and law enforcement is extremely slow. So there's. There's a real call for the international community to find a way to modernize uh, formal judicial cooperation. And I'm sure Mary would, would agree that sometimes it's a little bit um, frustratingly slow. Mary, you're back with us, I believe. You can hear us, I trust. Um, welcome back, Mary. I, I, I will, Thank you. I will move on to you, if I may, since we've got you back. It was a little bit of a, of a technological glitz here. But um, you're a career and uh, a career prosecutor specialized in anti-corruption, and I may say one of the top-notch ones in the United States. Tell us what is so difficult investigating international corruption. Why does it take so long? What's so hard about it? And and also in your experience with Ukraine, what do you think Ukraine has been doing really well in these last few years, trying to chase Yanukovych and other assets? and where maybe you think there could be more done in Ukraine from your experience and seeing it from the outside. Thanks so much, uh, Greta, and I'm, I apologize for the technological uh, challenge here. Um, the, I guess the most, um, it, uh, as you say, I oversee a, a uh, asset recovery program in the United States. We're focused on trying to recover assets linked to foreign corruption that affect the U.S. financial system. Uh, we have uh, tried to do um, a fair amount of work in Ukraine, and we um, are, I think, having um, some success there. Um, the main tool that we use is um, money laundering uh, violations coupled with non-conviction-based forfeiture. And the beauty of non-conviction-based forfeiture is we can use this tool um, whether or not uh, the people are in the United States, the true owners of the assets, whether or not uh, they're dead, whether or not they've transferred the assets to nominees or relatives. So, so it's potentially a very powerful tool. The problem is um, that our government, and like most governments in the world, requires that we establish that there's a financial transaction that affects the United States and a link to an underlying crime, the criminal origin of the asset. And that's the challenge. The identifying the financial transaction is usually relatively simple. It gets easier with beneficial ownership disclosure, but it's relatively simple. The challenge is in obtaining sufficient evidence of the misappropriation, the bribery, the embezzlement, or the bank fraud. And here is the real challenge, the evidence of these crimes is usually in the country where the crime occurred. And these are crimes committed in secret by people who want to keep this activity secret. 
And these kinds of investigations are difficult in any circumstances, but especially in a situation where there is very little political will uh, to attempt to address it. Now, despite that, um, we have worked with some very good partners who have very professionally conducted these investigations in their own country, while we, in parallel, uh, conduct them in ours. So, so this is a real, um, the real hard part. This is what takes the most time and the most dedication. And how about your experience in Ukraine? How would you describe uh, what you've seen in terms of, you know, investigative practice or, or, or also how they engage internationally with partners like the United States? Is there things where you feel like, okay, you're, you've made lots of progress here, but we need more of this or of that in Ukraine? Um, I, in general, I would say that um, our experience with these institutions, which have been set up since the Dignity Revolution, the NABU, the SOP, the um, high anti corruption courts, um, from our perspective, are doing an amazing job in a very short period of time. And our experience in working with NABU has shown that there are some very talented, very uh, smart, dedicated professionals who seem to be doing their work at a very high level. And so this is all very, very promising. And obviously we hope we'll be contributing uh, to our ultimate success. Uh, I guess um, what is so hard to watch about Ukraine is that uh, these very important institutional reforms um, which have um, been put into place. Um, it took almost as much energy to put them into place as it does to stop them from being unraveled. And this um, is painful, I'm sure, for these courageous people who, who helped to build the institutions. But we'll hang in there um, and do what we can uh, to support Ukraine and to try to recover uh, some more significant assets. Mary, I'm going to be a bit spontaneous here because we've lost Roger. He's still not back with us as far as I can tell. So I'll just, uh, no, we do have him back. Wonderful. So Mary, I'll, I'm back. Uh, I'll keep yeah. my surprise <laughs> question. Roger, I'm sorry, it seems that your slide's not coming through. Would you mind just talking us through uh, what you were going to say about how Switzerland can assist other countries uh, in recovering stolen assets? Of course, and I am sorry for the deconnection, but uh, I don't know what happened. Um, yes, so just very briefly, oh, there's the slide now, that's perfect. Um, I would just very briefly uh, explain the Swiss legal framework and this with the example of Ukraine. So um, in 22nd February 2014, the Ukrainian parliament voted to impeach President Yanukovych. And just four days later, the Swiss government decided to freeze all assets in Switzerland belonging to former president Yanukovych and his entourage. And so this uh, freeze was thanks to uh, what we call a PEP Act, <laughs> which allows to very quickly freeze assets if there's a regime change or, or other um, changes. And this gives the basis for a judicial cooperation. And you see that below uh, the, the box of asset, the assets frozen. And so perhaps once again, this PEP Act allows to freeze very quickly and gives finally time for a new government and new authorities to engage in a judicial cooperation. And this happened between Switzerland and Ukraine. Uh, there has been this cooperation between 2014 and 2020. And Switzerland was able to transmit to Ukraine evidence on the assets located in Switzerland. Um, if you go one box further, then you see the judgment in Ukraine. So. Uh, to restitute finally, it's absolutely crucial that there will be final judgments uh, rendered by the Ukrainian um, judiciary uh, in order to confiscate the assets and then to restitute them. And there is a time limit. Um, we are able to freeze assets for 10 years. You see that in the first box. And so it means that we should be able to restitute until 2024, which gives us another three years. And we really hope that we will be able um, 
to restitute those assets within this time limit. One word about the, the practice. Um, uh, I think it's important to realize that it's every state has its own legal order and that for the cooperation to be fruitful, a mutual understanding of the requirements and expectations of the other state must be developed. In the case of Ukraine, Switzerland decided to support financially a third party, the International Center for Asset Recovery, to act as a bridge builder between the Swiss and Ukrainian authorities and to foster mutual understanding. And as you are the managing director, Greta, you are very well aware of this work. And in my eyes, ICAR has played an important role in the success of this first phase of judicial cooperation. And I'm very confident that um, this fruitful cooperation will, will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. And uh, indeed, thanks uh, to the Swiss authorities for having supported us. I think you're pointing to two very important facts, which is on the one hand, the PEP law that Switzerland has, which is really intended to give victim countries the time they need. After political trans transformation, there is a need for institutions to build up again. And these cases, as we heard from Mary and, and from Artem as well, are they take time to investigate. So that law is essential because it gives a degree of space for the victim countries to actually engage in a meaningful and high quality investigation. Of course, we know now it's running out in two to three years. So Artem, there's a bit of pressure on us here in Ukraine, but uh, let's see how far we can go. And I know it's not all only you're doing, there's other actors involved, of course, as well. And the other point is, um, Roger, what you pointed out as the translation work, there's a lot of mutual understanding, which really is not something about the law, but about communication. So again, here, I think uh, these are two important points to be taken into account. Now, <coughs> excuse me, a question to, to Roger and Mary together, actually, or I mean, one after the other, Mary, maybe first. We do know, uh, and that's part of the reason why you're on the panel, the United States and Switzerland have been known in the past to harbor assets that were stolen from other jurisdictions. But the same is also the reason why both both your countries have kind of been propelled to become the pioneers or the, you know, in bringing innovation to international asset recovery. Personally, I can see that it's still only a handful of countries who are really serious about recovering stolen assets. They may still not be the perfect financial centers, but they're serious about recovering stolen assets. Assuming you agree that your countries are among the pioneers, what would you like to see other countries do? Because it's not just up to the US and Switzerland to assist countries like Ukraine. Mary, maybe first, what would you like to see happen internationally? Thanks so much, Greta. So I would say two things. I mean, the first is that we need to use the momentum of the international focus, especially on corruption this year, here at this conference, at the G7, UNGAS, FATF plenary, the OECD anti-bribery convention plenaries, the UNCAC conference of state parties, everywhere we can to join with international partners to fight against complacency in uh, establishing safe havens for illicit money. As the Swiss and the, and the US and the UK make uh, greater and greater commitments <laughs> to try to prevent their own economies from being safe havens, for corruption proceeds, we see that new havens, new safe havens are starting to develop. And we really um, need to fight uh, the possibility that these new, new countries um, cre create the conditions where safe uh, money can safely be hidden and where they provide a little international cooperation. So we, we really uh, need to uh, band together um, to try to, to stop this. And, and second, I would say that, um, it, echoing my earlier comments, we, we really need jurisdictions where the corruption occurred to work as much as possible to preserve evidence, to gather evidence in the most professional and lawful ways, because it's with that evidence that your foreign partners, where there is some jurisdiction, some activity, can actually do something meaningful to help you recover those assets. Thanks, Greta. Thank you, Mary, and um, I can only echo very much that we need to use this momentum at the moment and be sincere in, in, in also addressing the issues with those countries where 
the criminals are now diversifying their investments. They're sending them to other jurisdictions where there's not the same legal framework and not the same will. Uh, Roger, uh, what do you say to what you heard from Mary and what are some of the thoughts that you have in terms of where the international community needs to come together more? Many thanks. I would like to say two things uh, as well. Uh, first, practice, practice, practice. Um, I think uh, we should start practicing <laughs> the asset recovery. I think it's very important that there's an increasing attention paid to asset recovery on a multilateral level. But there's also a risk that uh, there's that they think there's a need for new structures, for new tools, and so on. I think personally, I believe that the tools are there. We just have to use them. And it would be great to see other countries using those tools. And of course, we are always uh, happy to share our experience with, with uh, other countries. And secondly, um, I would like to see partnerships. I think also from a practical perspective, uh, we always try to engage in, in a spirit of cooperation, of partnership. And I think that's absolutely key uh, to succeed in, in asset recovery. Thank you so much, Roger. And it turns out we are spot on time. I've got the red light blinking at me, so there's a lot more to be said. Uh, but I do want to stress maybe my personal take on things and also echoing uh, uh, Artem's point. Yes, international cooperation is still a very long and slow process. We need to reform it. But while we are waiting for this reform to happen and hopefully actively pushing it, we need to be as unbureaucratic as possible. There is many ways to simplify MLA simply by just being understanding of each other's challenges. And I think the US and the Switzerland are excellent partners in this regard and examples to follow. And they do have a very reliable partner in Artem Sitnik. So I couldn't have been happier to have those three, two, uh, three people on the panel with me. With that, many thanks. Have a lovely afternoon and over to the next session. Thank you.